When you're walking through a modern city like this one, it's hard to imagine a time when the city didn't exist. But every city has a beginning. In this series of programs, we're going to look at Australia's major cities and see how they started. We're going to revisit the places where the British first arrived and see if we can look beneath the concrete and the bricks to find the places that were important for the very first white settlers. In doing so, I hope you'll not only see how the past can be hidden by the present, but also how, by looking more closely, you can rediscover that history. Our journey starts here, in the first white settlement on the mainland of Australia, at the place we now call Sydney. Sydney was founded as a penal colony, a sort of open-air prison for habitual criminals. In 1787, a fleet of ships set sail from England. The American Revolution of 1776 had created a crisis in prison management as convicts could no longer be transported there. Distant Australia seemed an ideal solution to the problem. In January 1788, the fleet, with around a thousand people on board, sailed into Botany Bay. Arthur Phillip was in charge, and he became the first governor of the new British colony. This memorial statue can be found in the Sydney Botanic Gardens. Botany Bay is now the location for an oil and container storage depot and for Sydney's main airport. But back then, it was a land of swamps, scattered grassland and sandy mounds surrounded by saltwater inlets. Quite quickly, Philip realised that despite Captain Cook's reports from 18 years earlier, this was no place to start a settlement. For one thing, there was no fresh water, a basic requirement for any settlement, something we take for granted today. Unlike Sydney Cove, where ships many times larger than the ones in the first fleet can anchor close to shore, unsheltered Botany Bay was unsuitable as a harbour. The fleet carried enough food to last for two years. After that, they would have to rely on supplies arriving from England and being able to harvest the crops grown from seeds they brought with them. A good landing place had to be found urgently. There was livestock on board the ships, which needed grass to feed on. So Philip ordered his crew back to the boat and they set off to explore a spot that Captain Cook had noted back in 1770 but never explored. It was an inspired decision. The fleet couldn't move far from where the British expected them to be, or they'd never be found. The fleet passed through the heads at Port Jackson on Monday, the 21st of January, 1788, and found one of the best harbors in the world. They first sailed here to Manly Cove, where they were met by unarmed Aborigines. Named the cove Manly because he thought the natives looked particularly fit and strong. They then sailed back across the harbour entrance and camped here at a spot that's still called Camp Cove. Having set camp, Philip and his party set off to explore the land around the bay. They were looking at a spot where ships could anchor close to the shore, where there were no cliffs, and above all, where there was a good water supply. He found what he was looking for here, at a cove he named Sydney Cove, after Lord Sydney, the British Secretary of State, to whom Philip had to report. And this is the water supply. Well, all we can see of it now. It's covered over by roads and buildings, but back then it was a clear stream running through a forest of gum trees. You can take tours through the tunnels that now house the stream and stand at streets where the river once ran, including Tank Stream Way, which runs south off Bridge Street. But otherwise, other than this plaque, there's nothing to see of what was the first essential ingredient for a settlement, a supply of fresh water.
Philip returned to Botany Bay to tell the rest of the fleet. On the 26th of January, 1788, they landed, pitched tents, and raised a flag on the beach to claim the land for the British Crown. The approximate spot where that small ceremony took place is marked today by this flag, British flag of Queen Anne. It's missing one cross, the cross of St Patrick. That was added later, when Ireland was incorporated into the United Kingdom. And this is what the area looks like today. No sign of water or a beach. This 1840 building, the Customs House, and the square in front of it cover the spot where the beach used to be. To understand the impact that this was to have on the local inhabitants, we need to put it into perspective. Aborigines had lived here for 50,000 years. In this area, there were perhaps a few hundred families. Philip was bringing a thousand people to live on their land. A thousand people who had to be housed, fed and watered. Despite Philip's peaceful intentions, this was a massive invasion. The first task for the new settlers was to offload the livestock so they could feed on the grasses that grew here. There were seven horses, four cows, two bulls, just over 30 sheep, some pigs and turkeys, rabbits, geese, ducks and chickens. And they all came to the beach at this place we now call Circular Quay. Today it's a busy transport hub and popular tourist destination. Sydney Harbour ferries depart from here and the railway and the Carl Expressway pass over the place where trees and native grasses used to grow. It takes about five minutes to walk from one end of Circular Quay to the other. That gives you some idea how crowded it must have been at that first landing. Although Philip and his officers had done a remarkable job of keeping the prisoners and crew healthy on the voyage from England, inevitably there was some sickness, and so a hospital had to be improvised. The tents for the first hospital in Australia were near here, close to where Argyle and George Street now meet. George Street follows the walking track that was made all those years ago by the convicts who carried the sick to their camp beds in the hospital. The site was later used as a watch house this police station was built on the site in 1882. The first Christian prayer service was conducted under a tree on Sunday, February the 3rd, by the chaplain Richard Johnson. The monument site at the corner of Hunter and Bly Streets is called Richard Johnson Square. The tree is long gone and we can't be sure exactly where the ceremony was actually held, but the monument marks the likely spot. And this was the text of that first sermon. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? One wonders what the convicts would have made of that sentiment. Soldiers were detailed to start clearing the land around the beach. Many trees were cut down and a saw pit was dug to saw timber for barracks. This contemporary sketch gives some idea of how Sydney Cove might have looked before the land was cleared. It was going to take some time to build permanent barracks. Meanwhile, soldiers and convicts alike had to make do with tents and temporary huts made of mud and sticks. A prefabricated canvas dwelling was set up as the governor's residence. And when it rained, it was a muddy flood, like a drowned campsite. Unlike the straight roads and ordered buildings we see today, earliest Sydney was a fairly random collection of tents and improvised temporary dwellings. Quite quickly, any grass that had been near the beach was used up and the livestock were taken to graze at an area separate from the campsite on this land close to where Government House and the Botanic Gardens now are. This part of the harbour to the east of Government House is named Farm Cove. 
The area that was cleared in these earliest weeks probably extended to here, where Hunter Street now runs, which is around a five minute walk from where the beach would have been. Although most of the convicts were unwilling or unable to do anything to help with developing the settlement, some of the settlers did try hunting for kangaroo, shooting birds or catching fish, but with very limited success. To survive, they still had to rely on the supplies that they brought on the ship from England. There was an urgent need to establish gardens to plant the seeds that they brought with them. And they did so in February on this island, Garden Island. In those days, Garden Island was not connected to them, which made it easier to protect from thieves and animals. The land that now joins it to Potts Point was reclaimed from the sea in 1945. There was also a need to build storehouses so that the ships could be unloaded. The problem was, getting the convicts to do anything was incredibly difficult, and there were few people with the necessary carpentry skills to do the task. So progress was very slow. This is Dawes Park. It's named after Lieutenant William Dawes, who was responsible for one of the earliest completed buildings in the settlement. The cannon you can see were restored for the park redevelopment in 2001 and marked the location of the first battery, erected in 1791. An astronomical observatory was erected at this spot in 1788. The approach to the famous Harbour Bridge dominates the park and splits it in two. The observatory was built because although the primary objective of the First Fleet was to establish a penal colony, it was also a voyage of scientific discovery. The Museum of Sydney is located here, at the corner of Philip and Bridge Streets. It occupies an important historic site, as this was the place where, in May 1788, Philip laid a stone and ordered a new dwelling be built to replace the prefabricated canvas one that had served as government house up until then. The area the British took possession of that they called New South Wales was an enormous tract of land that included most of eastern Australia. The King's birthday was celebrated shortly after the Government House stone laying, and as part of the celebrations, the boundaries of the first county were decided on. England was divided into counties, so it seemed natural that Australia would be divided up the same way. Cumberland County, as it was called after the King's brother, extended from Broken Bay in the north to where Wollongong now is in the south, and as far as the Blue Mountains in the west. The settlement was now well enough established to consider a town plan, and Philip set about designing one. However, it was never realised. A major problem was that to build with brick or stone required supplies of lime, and there was none to hand. Some could be made by burning shells, but this was a long and arduous process. Added to that, the brick kilns were difficult to maintain. So the process of replacing the temporary buildings was a slow one, and soon the rough tracks that enabled people to move between different parts of the settlement became entrenched as permanent ways. The rather messy labyrinth of paths can still be seen in the road routes of parts of the circular key area. Even after a couple of months, it became apparent that the poor soil around Sydney Cove was never going to yield sufficient crops to feed the soldiers and the convicts. The food situation was becoming perilously low. And even though they'd found some mutton birds on a nearby island, the abundance of wild food they'd hoped to find was never going to materialise. They needed alternative food sources urgently. So another site to plant crops had to be found. And here, at Parramatta, it was. Philip called it Rose Hill, after a neighbour of his in England and there's still a suburb of that name in the area. Rose Hill had good soil and it could be reached by water. Furthermore, it was close enough to the main settlement to service its needs. This ferry runs a regular commuter service down the river to Circular Quay, even today. Philip put Captain Watkin Tench in charge of developing the new settlement. By December of 1789, wheat and barley were harvested. Not enough to feed the settlers for long, but sufficient to suggest that it might do so in the future. This council sign that stands in Harris Street 
tells the story of James Roos. He was a convict who'd served his time and, unlike most in his position, wanted to remain in Australia. Philip gave him permission to start a small experimental farm at this location on a hill just south of Parramatta River. The farm was a success and grew to be quite a sizeable holding that would cover several modern blocks. Roos subsequently sold it to John Harris, a surgeon who lived with the Second Fleet. This is the Experiment Farm Cottage, built by Harris around 1798. The house overlooks Harris Park, which is in the foreground. The distant playing fields are in the park named after James Roos. Roos Street runs up to the cottage. Parramatta grew to become this thriving suburb of Sydney. At one time it was considered as the location for the major settlement. This is a picture of the alternative government house that was built in 1790. By the end of that year, there were 500 convicts and 29 soldiers living at Rose Hill in 32 houses. A substantial track had been formed that joined Rose Hill with Sydney Cove and a crude boat was built to carry supplies to and from the settlement. Unlike this modern ferry, it was so slow and cumbersome, it was named the Lump. The authorities in London knew that the supplies Arthur had brought with him were sufficient to last for a maximum of two years. He had no way of knowing whether new supplies were on their way. By early 1790, the situation was getting desperate. In the hope of getting early sighting of any ship that came from England, in January, a flagpole was erected here at South Head, where a ship could be seen and a signal sent to the settlement. This signal station was built on the site in the late 1840s. This is the Macquarie Lighthouse, the oldest in Australia, and it can be seen close by. By May 1790, almost all work on the settlement had stopped. Everyone was on starvation rations. Few people had the energy to do any work, even if they'd wanted to. This could have been the end of Sydney, before it had even really started. But help did finally arrive, when on the 20th of June, the storeship Justinian sailed into harbour. The second fleet was on its way, and although it would bring more than a thousand new mouths to feed, it would also bring skilled labour who could help to build a permanent settlement. By the end of 1790, Sydney was here to stay. Here are some of the key locations mentioned in the program. Botany Bay, where the first fleet first dropped anchor in Australia, and where Sydney's airport and oil storage terminals are located. The heads at Port Jackson, through which Arthur Phillips sailed on the 21st of January, 1788. Camp Cove, where Phillips set camp when he first came to explore Sydney Harbour. Manly Cove, where Philip was met by people he thought looked particularly fit and strong. Sydney Cove, the landing place Philip found that was most suitable for setting up a settlement. Tank Stream Way, part of the old course of the tank stream, the water supply Philip needed for the settlement to be viable. Circular Quay, where the settlement was first established. The location of the first hospital on George Street, near the rocks. Richard Johnson Square, the site of the first Christian prayer service. The Sydney Botanic Gardens, on the site where livestock were taken to graze. Hunter Street, the probable boundary of the first cleared land. The Sydney Museum, the site where the first government house was built. The flagpole 
next to the customs house, where Flip first raised a flag on the beach and claimed the land for the British Crown.